As we learned last time, in 1900, Max Planck discovered that although light moves in Maxwell's waves, it's also absorbed and emitted in discrete amounts of energy. Einstein went on to show that this discreteness in the light waves was an attribute of the light waves themselves and not of the atoms that were emitting and absorbing them. That is, the light waves were organized into discrete quantities of energy, which Einstein called light quanta, and we now call photons. So somehow light is both a wave and a particle. But we should be clear about what the word particle means. In this case, it does not mean hard little nugget. Instead, it means discrete and indivisible. A photon of light is a bundle of energy that cannot be split apart. It always equals Planck's constant times its frequency. What does it mean for a particle to have a frequency? Therein lies the fascinating tale of wave-particle duality. Light travels in waves. It carries its energy in waves. But when it's forced to deposit that energy on some surface or some entity, it always does so in discrete amounts at discrete point-like locations. And that discrete amount and that discrete location is the photon. That's clear, isn't it? So, maybe an example would help. This is my green laser pen. I use it when I'm giving talks. It's very bright. This laser pen is a photon gun. It fires a stream of photons in a very narrow beam. The number of photons it fires is huge but discreet. Those photons leave this gun and they travel in a wave towards the wall. When that wave strikes the wall, the wave deposits its energies upon the atoms of the wall in discrete amounts upon discrete atoms. Those atoms then reflect those photons back outwards towards our eyes and we see the green spot on the wall. Now, let's just say that I had a knob on this laser pen that would adjust the rate at which the photons were fired. Maybe I could turn that knob all the way down so that it fired one photon a second. Kind of like that. And then the blinks you would see on the wall would be one photon each, depositing its energy at a particular discrete location with a very particular discrete energy. So, now let's crank the firing rate of this laser back up to trillions of photons per second and we'll shine it through something that's got a bunch of tiny little slits in it like my comb. What should we see on the wall? Presumably the beam will pass through the slits and strike the wall and so we should see one green spot on the wall. But if you looked closely inside that spot, you would see the shadow of the slits. We can illustrate this by using this flashlight and a paper plate with two big holes in it. We can still see the flashlight beam, but only the part that's getting through the two holes. But now let's go back to my laser, and instead of a comb, we'll use this diffraction grating, which has got a whole bunch of little slits in it, 13,500 per inch. We'll shine that laser through this again, and we get stripes, spots. Look at that. And of course, that's exactly what you'd expect if the light were traveling in waves. You see, the waves pass through the slits in the diffraction grating. They break up into a bunch of little tiny independent waves, one for each slit. 
Those little waves move towards the wall, but as they do so, they interfere with each other, resulting in this characteristic pattern of wave interference. That, my friends, is an interference pattern. And if I take the slits away, I get one nice little spot on the screen. I put the slits back in, I get the interference pattern again. How cool is this? So now let's crank our laser pen down so that it's only firing one photon per second. What do we see? Well, we see one flash per second, all right. But the location of those flashes is strange. They seem to be all over the screen. It's as though the photons have no idea which direction to go. But if we accumulate all those little flashes over an hour or so, we find something really startling. We see the interference pattern. Each photon travels as a wave. That wave passes through the slits and breaks into many waves which then interfere with themselves. And yet the photon still lands at a discrete location with a discrete energy. Where will the photon land? There's no way to know. It's completely random. But the odds are that the photon's going to land where the interference pattern is bright. The odds are very low that the photon will land where the interference pattern is dim. Did you hear what I just said? I said odds. Odds. What is it that determines where a photon will land? Odds. Odds in the shape of an interference pattern. Apparently, the wave of a photon is a wave of odds, a wave of chance. A light wave is not a wave through the ether. It's a wave of probabilities. And that just makes my head hurt. And so these waves of probability propagate through space and interfere with each other, leaving an interference pattern of probability on the screen. The position of the photon is undetermined until that photon strikes the wall and deposits its energy. Up to that time, the position of the photon is uncertain. And the principle behind that uncertainty will be our topic for next time. Alright, now I want you to be a little bit patient, because what you're about to hear is going to sound like another science lecture, but it's not. It's actually quite relevant to the Liskov substitution principle. In the second half of the 19th century, a German mathematician by the name of Friedrich Ludwig Gottlob Frigg decided to treat mathematics the way Euclid had treated geometry. His goal was to derive all of mathematics from a few simple postulates. In 1879, he succeeded, and he published a paper whose title in English was A Formal Language for Pure Thought Modeled on Arithmetic. It was a masterpiece. Frege had created a formalism that allowed him to describe all of mathematics integers, fractions, functions, you name it. Math from logic. Can you see where this is going? Not only could Frege describe mathematics with his formalism, he could describe virtually anything. This formalism of his resolved a whole series of problems that had plagued logicians and mathematicians for years. 23 years later, Bertrand Russell discovered the first chink in Frege's formalism. He showed that it was possible to create paradoxical statements using Frege's logical language 
statements that could be proved neither false nor true. Russell's paradox looked like this. It can be described with this simple question. Does the set of all sets that don't contain themselves contain itself? So, now you should hit pause and then play that over again. And then hit pause again and play it over again. And keep doing that until you understand it. Or perhaps you should look at it this way. If your mother only cooks for those who don't cook for themselves, who cooks for your mother? Or, if you want it to be really simple, this statement is false. Clearly the question cannot be answered. In fact, the question is caught in a logical loop. There's no resolution to that loop. If you were to write a program to solve it, that program would loop forever, recursing infinitely, and would blow the stack. 